In the past, politicians promised to create a better world. They had different ways of achieving this, but their power and authority came from the optimistic visions they offered their people. Those dreams failed, and today people have lost faith in ideologies. Increasingly, politicians are seen simply as managers of public life. But now, they have discovered a new role that restores their power and authority. Instead of delivering dreams, politicians now promise to protect us from nightmares. They say that they will rescue us from dreadful dangers that we cannot see and do not understand. And the greatest danger of all is international terrorism, a powerful and sinister network with sleeper cells in countries across the world. A threat that needs to be fought by a war on terror. But much of this threat is a fantasy which has been exaggerated and distorted by politicians. It's a dark illusion that has spread unquestioned through governments around the world, the security services and the international media. This is a series of films about how and why that fantasy was created and who it benefits. <laughs> At the heart of the story are two groups, the American neoconservatives and the radical Islamists. Both were idealists who were born out of the failure of the liberal dream to build a better world. And both had a very similar explanation of what caused that failure. These two groups have changed the world, but not in the way that either intended. Together, they created today's nightmare vision of a secret organized evil that threatens the world. A fantasy that politicians then found restored their power and authority in a disillusioned age. And those with the darkest fears became the most powerful. The story begins in the summer of 1949, when a middle-aged school inspector from Egypt arrived at the small town of Greeley in Colorado. His name was Saeed Kutub. Kutub had been sent to the US to study its educational system, and he enrolled in the local state college. His photographs appear in the college yearbook. But Kutub was destined to become much more than a school inspector. Out of his experiences of America that summer, Kutub was going to develop a powerful set of ideas that would directly inspire those who flew the planes on the attack of September the 11th. As he had traveled across the country, Kutub had become increasingly disenchanted with America. The very things that on the surface made the country look prosperous and happy, Kutub saw as signs of an inner corruption and decay. This was Truman's America, and many Americans today regard it as a golden age of their civilization. But for Kutub, he saw a sinister side in this. All around him was crassness, uh, corruption, um, vulgarity, um, talk centered on movie stars and automobile prices. He was also very concerned that the inhabitants of Greeley spent a lot of time in lawn care, pruning their hedges, cutting their lawns. This, for Kutub, was indicative of the selfish and materialistic aspect of American life. Americans lived these isolated lives surrounded by their lawns. They lusted after material goods. And this, says Kutub quite succinctly, is the taste of America. What Kutub believed he was seeing was a hidden and dangerous reality underneath the surface of ordinary American life. One summer night, he went to a dance at a local church hall. He later wrote that what he saw that night crystallized his vision. He talks about how the pastor played on the gramophone, one of the big band hits of the day, Baby, It's Cold Outside. He dimmed the lights so as to create a dreamy, romantic effect. 
And then Kudib says that chests met chests, arms really circled waists, and the hall was outside. full of lust and love. I've got to go but away. But baby, it's cold outside. This evening is been been hoping that you drop To most people watching this dance, it would have been an innocent picture of youthful happiness. Like but Kutub saw something else. The dancers in front of him were tragic lost souls. They believed that they were free, but in reality, they were trapped by their own selfish and greedy desires. American society was not going forward. It was taking people backwards. They were becoming isolated beings, driven by primitive animal forces. Such creatures, could have believed, could corrode the very bonds that held society together. And he became determined that night to prevent this culture of selfish individualism taking over his own country. But Kutub was not alone. At the same time, in Chicago, there was another man who shared the same fears about the destructive force of individualism in America. He was an obscure political philosopher at the University of Chicago. But his ideas would also have far-reaching consequences. Because they would become the shaping force behind the neoconservative movement, which now dominates the American administration. He was called Leo Strauss. Strauss is a mysterious figure. He refused to be filmed or interviewed. He devoted his time to creating a loyal band of students. And what he taught them was that the prosperous liberal society they were living in contained the seeds of its own destruction. He didn't uh, give interviews or write or political essays or uh appear on the radio, there wasn't TV yet, or, or things like that. But he did want to have a school of students to get others to see what he had seen, that Western liberalism led to nihilism, had, 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 had undergone a development that, uh, at the end of which it could no longer define itself or defend itself. A development which took everything praiseworthy and admirable out of human beings and made us into dwarf animals. It made us into herd animals, sick little dwarfs, satisfied with the dangerous life in which nothing is true and everything is permitted. Strauss believed that the liberal idea of individual freedom led people to question everything, all values, all moral truths. Instead, people were led by their own selfish desires, and this threatened to tear apart the shared values which held society together. But there was a way to stop this, Strauss believed. It was for politicians to assert powerful and inspiring myths everyone could believe in. They might not be true, but they were necessary illusions. One of these was religion, the other was the myth of the nation. And in America, that was the idea that the country had a unique destiny to battle against the forces of evil throughout the world. This myth was epitomized, Strauss told his students, in his favorite television program, Gunsmoke. Strauss was a great fan of American television. Gunsmoke was his great favorite, and he would hurry home from the seminar, which would end, you know, at 5.30 or so, to have a quick dinner so that he could be at his seat before the television set when Gunsmoke went on. And he felt that this was good, this show. This had a salutary effect on the American public because it showed the conflict between good and evil in a way that would be immediately intelligible to everyone. I see what happens. No. The hero has a white hat. He's faster on the draw than the bad man. The good guy wins. And it's not just that the good guy wins, but that the values are clear. That's America. We're going to triumph over the evils of, of, that are trying to destroy us, the virtues of the, of the Western frontier, good and evil. Leo Strauss's other favorite program was Perry Mason. And this, he told his students, epitomized the role that they, the elite, had to play. In public, they should promote the myths necessary to rescue America from decay. 
but in private, they didn't have to believe in them. Harry Mason was different from Gunsmoke, the extremely cunning man who, as far as we can see, is very virtuous and uses his great intelligence and quickness of mind to rescue his clients from dangers, but who could be fooling us because he's cleverer than we are. Is he really telling the truth? Maybe his client is guilty. In 1950, Saeed Kutub traveled back to Egypt from America. He too was determined to find some way of controlling the forces of selfish individualism. And as he traveled, he began to envisage a new type of society. It would have all the modern benefits of Western science and technology, but a more political Islam would have a central role to play in keeping individualism in check. It would provide a moral framework that would stop people's selfish desires from overwhelming them. I got spurs that jingle, jangle, jingle. As I go but could have realized that American culture was already spreading to Egypt, trapping the masses in its seductive dream. Here's to Thomas Lindsay Wolcott. What was needed, he believed, was an elite, a vanguard, who could see through these illusions of freedom, just as he had in America, and who would then lead the masses to realize the higher truth. The masses need to be led, and it is this vanguard group that will be responsible for the task of leading the people out of the darkness in, into the light of Islam. Because the masses had succumbed to their own selfish desires, and he wanted the vanguard to be different, to be pure, to be standing together outside of all of this corrupt situation. Bringing people back to the truth. On his return, Qutb became politically active in Egypt. He joined a group called the Muslim Brotherhood, who wanted Islam to play a major role in the governing of Egyptian society. And in 1952, the Brotherhood supported the revolution led by General Nasser that overthrew the last remnants of British rule. But Nasser very quickly made it clear that the new Egypt was going to be a secular society that emulated Western models. He quickly forged an alliance with America. And the CIA came to Egypt to organize security agencies for the new regime. Faced with this, the Muslim Brotherhood began to organize against Nasser. And in 1954, Qutb and other leading members of the Brotherhood were arrested by the security services. What then happened to Qutb was going to have consequences for the whole world. In the 1970s, this film was made that showed what happened in Nasser's main prison in the 50s and 60s. It was based on the testimony of survivors. Torturers who had been trained by the CIA unleashed an orgy of violence against the Muslim Brotherhood members accused of plotting to overthrow Nasser. At one point, Qutb was covered with animal fat and locked in a cell with dogs trained to attack humans. Inside the cell, he had a heart attack. كان حاسس بنفسه ان هو سوبر يعني حاجة أرقى من ان هو يعني كان فاهم ان هو مفكر إسلامي وشخصية عامة وشخصية قوية و و و و وبالتالي ما إنما في النهاية لما راح السجن الحربي أدلى بتفصيلات التفصيلات حوالين التنظيم وحوالين دوره في التنظيم وحوالين الإفتاءات اللي هو أفتاها اللي أخطرهم إنه كان بيفتي بنسف الأناطر الخيرية علشان يغرق الدلتا كلها باعتبارها أرض كفر Could have survived, but the torture had a powerful, radicalizing effect on his ideas. Up to this point, he had believed that the Western secular ideas simply created the selfishness and the isolation he had seen in the United States. But the torture, he believed, 
showed that this culture also unleashed the most brutal and barbarous aspects of human beings. Kutub began to have an apocalyptic vision of a disease that was spreading from the West throughout the world. He called it Jahiliya, a state of barbarous ignorance. And what made it so terrifying and insidious was that people didn't realize that they were infected. They believed that they were free and that their politicians were taking them forward to a new world, when in fact, they were regressing to a barbarous age. The sense is that Jehali is so dangerous now because it not only is advanced by Western powers, but Muslims, this is like a charge of false consciousness, Muslims have become infected with this Jehaliyyah. So now the threat of Islam is also from within. It's from without and within. It's the state of emergency because Jehaliyyah is a condition that pervades everything and everybody. It's even infected our powers of imagination. We don't even know that we're sick, that we now worship materialism and the self and individual truths over the real truths. Um, so it's an incredible sense of epic confrontation where Islam is being insulted on all fronts, from within, from without, culturally, militarily, economically, politically. And under those circumstances, any way of fighting it becomes justified and legitimate. And in fact, has a kind of existential weight because somehow it's doing God's will on earth. To Qutb, this force of Jahiliya had now gone so deep into the minds of Muslims that a dramatic way had to be found to free them. In a series of books he wrote secretly in prison, which were then smuggled out, Qutb called upon a revolutionary vanguard to rise up and overthrow the leaders who had allowed Jahiliya to infect their country. The implication was that these leaders could justifiably be killed because they had become so corrupted they were no longer Muslims, even though they said they were. Faced with this, Nasser decided to crush Qutb and his ideas. And in 1966, Qutb was put on trial for treason. This is the only known film of Qutb as he awaits sentence. The verdict was a foregone conclusion. And on August the 29th, 1966, Qutb was executed. But his ideas lived on. The day after his execution, a young schoolboy set up a secret group. He hoped that it would one day become the vanguard that Qutb had called for. His name was Ayman Zawahiri, and Zawahiri was to become the mentor to Osama bin Laden. But at the very moment when Syed Qutb's ideas seemed dead and buried, Leo Strauss's ideas about how to transform America were about to become powerful and influential because the liberal political order that had dominated America since the war started to collapse. Law and order have broken down in Detroit, Michigan. Pillage, looting, murder... And Only a few years before, President Johnson had promised policies that would create a new and a better world in America. He had called it the Great Society. The Great Society is a place where every child can find knowledge to enrich his mind. It is a place where the city of man... But now, in the wake of some of the worst riots ever seen in America, that dream seemed to have ended in violence and hatred. One prominent liberal journalist called Irving Crystal began to question whether it might actually be the policies themselves that were causing social breakdown. If you would ask any liberal in 1960, we are going to pass these laws, these laws, these laws, and these laws, mentioning all the laws that in fact were passed in the 1960s and 70s, would you say crime will go up, drug addiction will go up, illegitimacy will go up, or will they get down? Everyone would have said, obviously, they will get down and everyone would have been wrong. Now, that's not something that the liberals have been able to face up to. They had their reforms, and they have led to consequences that they did not expect, and they don't know what to do about. In the early 70s, Irving Kristol became the focus of a group of disaffected intellectuals in Washington. They were determined to understand why the optimistic liberal policies had failed. 
and they found the answer in the theories of Leo Strauss. Strauss explained that it was the very basis of the liberal idea, the belief in individual freedom, that was causing the chaos. Because it undermined the shared moral framework which held society together. Individuals pursued their own selfish interests and this inevitably led to conflict. As the movement grew, many young students who had studied Strauss's ideas came to Washington to join this group. Some, like Paul Wolfowitz, had been taught Strauss's ideas at the University of Chicago, as had Francis Fukuyama. And others, like Irving Kristol's son William, had studied Strauss's theories at Harvard. This group became known as the Neoconservatives. Well, many of them couldn't get academic jobs and political science or philosophy faculties were not terribly friendly to those of a conservative or moderately conservative disposition. And the truth is a lot of people who end up in Washington started off as academics, I did, Paul Wolfowitz did, and decided they probably didn't have very good prospects in the academy. What we all had in common, I think, was a certain doubt about what once seemed a kind of great certainty and confidence in liberal progress. The philosophic grounds for liberal democracy had been weakened. So I think Straussians who came to Washington, they didn't think of themselves as Churchill or Lincoln, and let me assure you, but they did think that, you know, there's something uh, noble about uh, public life and about politics, and they tried to make a contribution in, in, in many different areas. The neoconservatives were idealists. Their aim was to try and stop the social disintegration they believed liberal freedoms had unleashed. They wanted to find a way of uniting the people by giving them a shared purpose. And one of their great influences in doing this would be the theories of Leo Strauss. They would set out to recreate the myth of America as a unique nation whose destiny was to battle against evil in the world. And in this project, the source of evil would be America's Cold War enemy, the Soviet Union. And by doing this, they believed that they would not only give new meaning and purpose to people's lives, but they would spread the good of democracy around the world. The United States would not only, according to these uh, Straussians, be able to bring uh, good to the world, but would be able to overcome the fundamental weaknesses of American society, uh, a society that has been suffering, almost rotting in their language, from relativism, liberalism, lack of self-confidence, lack of belief in itself. And one of the main political projects of the Straussians during the Cold War was to reinforce the self-confidence of Americans and the belief that America was fundamentally the only force for good in the world that had to be supported otherwise evil would prevail. But to do this, the neoconservatives were going to have to defeat one of the most powerful men in the world. Henry Kissinger was the Secretary of State under President Nixon, and he didn't believe in a world of good and evil. What drove Kissinger was a ruthless, pragmatic vision of power in the world. With America's growing political and social chaos, Kissinger wanted the country to give up its ideological battles. Instead, it should come to terms with countries like the Soviet Union to create a new kind of global interdependence, a world in which America would be safe. I believe that with all the dislocations we know, now experience, there also exists an extraordinary opportunity to form for the first time in history a truly global society carried by the principle of interdependence. And if we act wisely and with vision, I think we can look back to all this turmoil as the birth pangs of a more creative and better system. Kissinger had begun this process in 1972 when he persuaded the Soviet Union to sign a treaty with America limiting nuclear arms. It was the start of what was called detente, and President Nixon returned to Washington to announce triumphantly that the age of fear was over. Last Friday in Moscow, we witnessed the beginning of the end of that era, which began in 1945. With this step, we have enhanced the security of both nations. 
we have begun to reduce the level of fear by reducing the causes of fear for our two peoples and for all peoples in the world. But a world without fear was not what the neoconservatives needed to pursue their project. And they now set out to destroy Henry Kissinger's vision. What gave them their opportunity was the growing collapse of American political power, both abroad and at home. The defeat in Vietnam and the resignation of President Nixon over Watergate led to a crisis of confidence in America's political class. And the neoconservatives seized their moment. They allied themselves with two right-wingers in the new administration of Gerald Ford. One was Donald Rumsfeld, the new Secretary of Defense. The other was Dick Cheney, the President's Chief of Staff. Rumsfeld began to make speeches alleging that the Soviets were ignoring Kissinger's treaties and secretly building up their weapons with the intention of attacking America. The Soviet Union has been busy. They've been busy in terms of their level of effort. They've been busy in terms of the actual weapons that they've been producing. They've been busy in terms of expanding production rates. They've been busy in terms of expanding their institutional capability to produce additional weapons at additional rates. They've been busy in terms of expanding their capability to in, in increasingly improve the sophistication of those weapons. Year after year after year, they've been demonstrating that they have steadiness of purpose, that they're purposeful about what they're doing. Now, your question is, what, what ought one to be doing about that? The CIA and other agencies who watched the Soviet Union continuously for any sign of threat said that this was a complete fiction. There was no truth to Rumsfeld's allegations. But Rumsfeld used his position to persuade President Ford to set up an independent inquiry. He said it would prove that there was a hidden threat to America. And the inquiry would be run by a group of neoconservatives, one of whom was Paul Wolfowitz. The aim was to change the way America saw the Soviet Union. And Rumsfeld won that very intense, uh, intense uh, political battle that was waged in Washington in 1975 and 1976. Now, as part of that battle, Rumsfeld and others, people such as Paul Wolfowitz, wanted to get into the CIA. And the mission was to create a much more severe view of the Soviet Union, Soviet intentions, uh, Soviet views about fighting and winning a nuclear war. The neoconservatives chose as the inquiry chairman a well-known critic and historian of the Soviet Union called Richard Pipes. Pipes was convinced that whatever the Soviets said publicly, secretly, they still intended to attack and conquer America. This was their hidden mindset. The inquiry was called Team B, and the other leading member was Paul Wolfowitz. And the idea was then to appoint a group of outside experts who have access to the same evidence as the CIA used, uh, to arrive at his conclusions and see if they cannot come up with a different conclusion. And I was asked to chair it, because I was not an expert on nuclear weapons. I was, if anything, an expert on the Soviet mindset, but not on the weapons. But that was a real key, uh, was the question of the Soviet mindset. Because the CIA looked only at, they were known as bean counters, they always looked at weapons. But weapons can be used in various ways. They can be used for defensive purposes or offensive purposes. Well, all right, I, I collected this group of uh, experts and we began to sift through the evidence. Team B began examining all the CIA data on the Soviet Union. But however closely they looked, there was little evidence of the dangerous weapons or defense systems they claimed the Soviets were developing. But rather than accept that this meant the systems didn't exist, Team B made an assumption that the Soviets had developed systems that were so sophisticated they were undetectable. For example, they could find no evidence that the Soviet submarine fleet had an acoustic defense system. But what this meant, TV said, was that the Soviets had actually invented a new non-acoustic system which was impossible to detect. And this meant that the whole of the American submarine fleet was at risk from an invisible threat that was there, even though there was no evidence for it. They couldn't say that the Soviets had acoustic means of picking up American submarines. Because they couldn't find it. Because they couldn't find it. 
So they said, well, maybe they have a non-acoustic means of making our submarine fleet vulnerable. But there was no evidence that they had a non-acoustic thing. They're saying, we can't find that they're doing it the way that everyone thinks they're doing it. So they must be doing it a different way. We don't know what that different way is, but they must be doing it. Even though there's no evidence? Even though there was no evidence. So they're saying there that the fact that a weapon doesn't exist... Doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It just means that we haven't found it. Well, that's important, yes. If something is not there, it's significant. By its absence? By its absence. If you believe that, that they share your view of strategic weapons, and they don't talk about it, then there's something missing, something is wrong. But the CIA wasn't aware of that. What Team B accused the CIA of missing was a hidden and sinister reality in the Soviet Union. Not only were there many secret weapons the CIA hadn't found, but they were wrong about many of those they could observe, such as the Soviet air defences. The CIA were convinced that these were in a state of collapse, reflecting the growing economic chaos in the Soviet Union. Team B said that this was actually a cunning deception by the Soviet regime. The air defense system worked perfectly. But the only evidence they produced to prove this was the official Soviet training manual, which proudly asserted that their air defense system was fully integrated and functioned flawlessly. The CIA accused Team B of moving into a fantasy world. The CIA w was very loath to deal with issues which could not be demonstrated in, in, in a kind of mathematical form, a scientific form. Uh, I said they could consider this soft evidence. They deal with realities, whereas this was a fantasy. That's how it was perceived. And there, was, there were battles all the time on this subject. Did you think it was a fantasy? No, I thought it was absolute reality. I would say that all of it was fantasy. I mean, they looked at uh, uh, radars out in uh, Krasnoyarsk and said, this is a laser beam weapon, when in fact it was nothing of the sort. They even took a Russian military manual, which the correct translation of it is the art of winning. And when they translated it and put it into Team B, they called it the art of conquest. Well, there's a difference between conquest and winning. And if you go through most of Team B's specific um, allegations about weapon systems and you just examine them one by one, they were all wrong. All of them? All of them. Nothing true. I don't believe anything in Team B was really true. The neoconservatives set up a lobby group to publicize the findings of Team B. It was called the Committee on the Present Danger, and a growing number of politicians joined, including a presidential hopeful, Ronald Reagan. Through films and television, the committee portrayed a world in which America was under threat from hidden forces that could strike at any time forces that America must conquer to survive. A concentration of world evil, of hatred for humanity, is taking place. And it is fully determined to destroy your society. Must you wait until the young men of America have to fall defending the borders of their continent? This dramatic battle between good and evil was precisely the kind of myth that Leo Strauss had taught his students would be necessary to rescue the country from moral decay. It might not be true, but it was necessary to re-engage the public in a grand vision of America's destiny that would give meaning and purpose to their lives. The neoconservatives were succeeding in creating a simplistic fiction, a vision of the Soviet Union as the center of all evil in the world, and America as the only country that could rescue the world. And this nightmarish vision was beginning to give the neoconservatives great power and influence. The Straussians started to create a worldview which is a fiction. The world is not divided uh, into uh, uh, good and evil. The battle in which we're engaged is not a battle between good and evil. The United States, as anyone who observes understands, uh, 
has done some good and some bad things, like any great power. It's just, this is the way history is. But they wanted to create a world of moral certainties. So therefore, they invent mythologies, fairy tales, uh, describing any force in the world that obstructs the United States as, a, uh, as somehow satanic or associated with evil. By the late 70s, Egypt had been transformed. On the surface, it had become a modern, westernized state with a prosperous middle class who were benefiting from a flood of Western capital that was being invested in the country. One member of this prosperous Egyptian elite was Ayman Zawahiri, who was now a young doctor, just starting his career. Ayman, he was an ideal person, who was a doctor coming from a very good family. His father was a professor in the university, his grandfather was an ambassador. His other grandfather was uh, like a sheikh of Al-Azhar, and a very well-respected family. He used to be a sort of person that acted by the book, not looking for prestige, not looking for money, not looking for uh, propaganda. Ayman became a leader because of his attitudes. In reality, Zawahiri was the leader of an underground Islamist cell. The group that he had started as a schoolboy, which he had modelled on the ideas of Saeed Qutb, had grown. Saeed Qutb's ideas were now spreading rapidly in Egypt, above all among students, because his predictions about the corruption from the West seemed to have come true. The government of President Sadat was controlled by a small group of millionaires who were backed by Western banks. The banks had been let in by what Sadat called his open-door policy. To the Western media, Sadat denied any corruption. But all Egyptians knew that this was a blatant lie. Who has benefited now from the open-door policy? Taxi drivers, the laborers, all those has benefited from the open-door policy. It is not like they say that uh, uh, there, has, uh, there are millionaires here and so. No, not at all. This is pure, uh, 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 pure uh, um, uh, um, black propaganda from the side of the Soviet Union and his agents here in the country. Zawahiri was convinced that the time was now approaching to fulfill Qutb's vision. The vanguard should rise up and overthrow this corrupt regime. And the man who would give the Islamists that opportunity would be Henry Kissinger. As part of his attempt to create a stable and balanced world, Kissinger had persuaded President Sadat to begin peace negotiations with the Israelis. To Kissinger, the ruthless pragmatist, religious divisions and hatreds were irrelevant. The most important thing was to create a safer world. And in 1977, Sadat had flown to Jerusalem to start the peace process. To the West, it was a heroic act. But to the Islamists, it was a complete betrayal. It showed that Sadat's mind had become so corrupted by the West that he was now completely under their control. And under the theories of Syed Qutb, this meant that he was no longer a Muslim. And so, could justifiably be killed. And then, in 1979, the Ayatollah Khomeini showed Zawahiri that his dream of creating an Islamist state was possible. Khomeini had inspired an uprising against the Shah of Iran. The Shah was another leader who had allowed Western banks to corrupt his country. And Khomeini had put forward the idea of an Islamist state, which was remarkably similar to Qutb's ideas. He acknowledged this by putting Qutb's face on one of the postage stamps of the new Islamic Republic. In his first sermon, Khomeini addressed the West. 
Yes, he told them. We are reactionaries and you are enlightened intellectuals. You who want freedom for everything. The freedom that will corrupt our country, corrupt our youth, and freedom that will pave the way for the oppressor. Freedom that will drag our country to the bottom. You sound very dissatisfied with, with what's happening in Iran now. Not more than dissatisfied. This is disgraceful, really. I was myself, I was a secretary general of the Muslim Congress at one time. This uh, uh, putting the name Islamic Revolution is a crime. Uh, a crime against Islam in the first hand. And President Sadat, do you expect that the Shah will accept the invitation? It seems like a good solution right now. Quote me. My aeroplane is ready to bring him here. Any moment. At the end of 1980, Ayman Zawahiri and a number of other followers of Qutb who had formed cells came together. They created an organization they called Islamic Jihad. Its leader was a man called Abdel Salam Faraj. And Faraj argued that they should kill Sadat in a spectacular way that would shock the masses. It would make them see the true reality of the corruption surrounding them, and they would rise up and overthrow the regime. And the Jihadi leader is also available now. For example, from the history of the history, I was one of them, and Ayman Zahari was one of them. وبشكل عام هذا الجيل له نفسية خاصة مختلفة عن الجيل الذي تربى في الفترة الليبرالية يعني كان يمكن أن نقول أنه هو جيل يعني أكثر تعبيرا عن الحالة الجهادية منه عن الحالة الوسطية أو الحالة يعني حالة التهادم مع الواقع يعني هو كان طبيعة الجيل من الناحية النفسية أنها طبيعة فيها جانب يعني استعلاء على الواقع محاولة تغيير الواقع ومن ثم كان الشباب الإسلامي في هذا الوقت الشباب الثوري كان مهيا إن هو يعني في خياله أنه يود أن لو يحكم Those who carried out the assassination were a group of army officers who were a part of Islamic Jihad. They were immediately arrested and the regime launched a massive manhunt for those behind the plot. But the effect of the assassination on the Egyptian people was not what Zawahiri had hoped for. That night, Cairo remained calm. The masses failed to rise up. And in the following weeks, Zawahiri and many other conspirators were arrested. The assassins were tried immediately and executed. But then, nearly 300 Islamists, including Zawahiri, were put on trial in a pavilion in Cairo's industrial exhibition park. It was agreed that Zawahiri would be their spokesman. Zawahiri, the man is an aristocrat. He comes from a, a major Egyptian-Saudi family and uh, he thinks that, you know, he, he, is, the, he is a visionary. And uh, the means do not mat matter, just as in Lenin, I mean, revolution in one country or revolution worldwide. He was convinced that this was, uh, this was a means to, to mobilize the masses, that he, they had tried something, that it had not worked. And he felt that, you know, the masses uh, were still under the spell of ideology, the ideology of America and he's looking for a new strategy. At the trial, Zawahiri was sentenced to three years in prison, along with many others of Islamic Jihad. He was taken to cells behind the police national museum, where, like Syed Qutb, he was tortured. And under this torture, he began to interpret Qutb's theories in a far more radical way. The mystery for Zawahiri was why the Egyptian people had failed to see the truth and rise up. It must be because the infection of selfish individualism had gone so deep into people's minds 
that they were now as corrupted as their leaders. And Zawahiri now seized on a terrible ambiguity in Qutb's argument. It wasn't just leaders like Sadat who were no longer real Muslims. It was the people themselves. And Zawahiri believed that this meant that they too could legitimately be killed. But such killing, Zawahiri believed, would have a noble purpose because of the fear and the terror that it would create in the minds of ordinary Muslims. It would shock them into seeing reality in a different way. They would then see the truth. Ayman Zawahiri came to the conclusion that because you have what you believe to be a sublime objective, then the means can be as ugly as they can get. You can kill as many people as you wish because the end means is noble. The logic is that we are the vanguards, we are the correct Muslims, everybody else is wrong. Not only wrong, but everybody else is not a Muslim. And the only means available to us today is just to kill our way to perfection. I am going to a city where the roses never fade. And at this very same moment, religion was being mobilized politically in America, but for a very different purpose. And those encouraging this were the neoconservatives. Many neoconservatives had become advisors to the presidential campaign of Ronald Reagan. And as they became more involved with the Republican Party, they had forged an alliance with the religious wing of the party, because it shared their aim of the moral regeneration of America. The notion that a purely secular society can cope with all of the terrible pathologies that now uh, affect our society, I think, is, has turned out to be false, and that has made me culturally conservative. I mean, I really think religion has a role now to play in redeeming the country, and liberalism is not prepared to give religion a role. Conservatism is, but it doesn't know how to do it. By the late 70s, there were millions of fundamentalist Christians in America, but their preachers had always told them not to vote. It would mean compromising with a doomed and immoral society. But the neoconservatives and their new Republican allies made an alliance with a number of powerful preachers who told their followers to become involved in politics for the first time. I'm sick and tired of hearing about all of the radicals and the perverts and the liberals and the leftists and the communists coming out of the closets. It's time for God's people to come out of the closets, out of the churches, and change America. We must do it. The conservative movement up to that point was essentially an intellectual movement. Uh, it had some very powerful thinkers, but it didn't have many troops. And uh, as uh, Stalin said of the Pope, where are his divisions? Well, we didn't have many divisions. When these folks became active, all of a sudden, the conservative movement had lots of divisions. We were able to move literally millions of people. And this is something that uh, we had no ability to do prior to that time. Literally millions. Literally millions. And at the beginning of 1981, Ronald Reagan took power in America. The religious vote was crucial in his election because many millions of fundamentalists voted for the first time. And as they had hoped, many neoconservatives were given power in the new administration. Paul Wolfowitz became head of the State Department policy staff, while his close friend Richard Pearl became the Assistant Secretary of Defence. And the head of Team B, Richard Pipes, became one of Reagan's chief advisers. The neoconservatives believed that they now had the chance to implement their vision of America's revolutionary destiny, to use the country's power aggressively as a force for good in the world, in an epic battle to defeat the Soviet Union. It was a vision 
that they shared with millions of their new religious allies. I take a personal and public stand as a, as a minister, a stand against communism, to destroy it, to wipe it from the face of the earth, because believe you me, these people are dedicated to the destruction of the United States of America and freedom as we know it. But the neoconservatives faced immense opposition to this new policy. It came not just from the bureaucracies in Congress, but from the president himself. Reagan was convinced that the Soviet Union was an evil force, but he still believed that he could negotiate with them to end the Cold War. Reagan didn't at first quite understand that the aggressiveness is rooted in the system. He, uh, he had a rather benign view of human beings. He was a very kindly man, and he attributed kind motives to others. There was another form of mirror imaging. And he would say more than one occasion, if, something like this, if I could just sit down with the Soviet leaders and explain to them that they're following a wrong ideology, and they adopt the right ideology, they could make the people happy and prosperous. So he said, Mr. President, that is not going to do it. You have to go after the system. Force them to reform the system. It took him a very long time to assimilate this view. To persuade the president, the neoconservatives set out to prove that the Soviet threat was far greater than anyone, even Team B, had previously shown. They would demonstrate that the majority of terrorism and revolutionary movements around the world were actually part of a secret network coordinated by Moscow to take over the world. The main proponent of this theory was a leading neoconservative who was the special advisor to the Secretary of State. His name was Michael Ledeen, and he had been influenced by a best-selling book called The Terror Network. It alleged that terrorism was not the fragmented phenomenon that it appeared to be. In reality, all terrorist groups, from the PLO to the bader meinhof group in Germany and the Provisional IRA, all of them were a part of a coordinated strategy of terror run by the Soviet Union. But the CIA completely disagreed. They said this was just another neoconservative fantasy. CIA denied it. They tried to convince people that we were really crazy. I mean, they, they, never, believed, they never believed that the Soviet Union was a driving force in the international terror network. They always wanted to believe that terrorist organizations were just what they said they were, local groups trying to avenge terrible evils done to them or trying to rectify uh, terrible social conditions or things like that. I mean, CIA really did buy into the rhetoric. I, I don't know what their motive was. I, I mean, I, I don't know what people's motives are, hardly ever. And I don't much worry about motives. But the neoconservatives had a powerful ally. He was William Casey, and he was the new head of the CIA. Casey was sympathetic to the neoconservative view, and when he read the Terror Network book, he was convinced. He called a meeting of the CIA's Soviet analysts at their headquarters and told them to produce a report for the president that proved this hidden network existed. But the analysts told him this would be impossible because much of the information in the book came from black propaganda the CIA themselves had invented to smear the Soviet Union. They knew that the terror network didn't exist because they themselves had made it up. And when we looked through the book, we found very clear episodes where CIA black propaganda, uh, clandestine uh, information that was designed under a covert action plan to be planted in European uh, newspapers were picked up and put in this book. A lot of it was made up, right? It was made up out of whole cloth. You told him this? We told him that, point blank. And we even had the operations people to tell Bill Casey this. I thought maybe this might have an impact, but all of us were dismissed. Casey had made up his mind. He knew the Soviets were involved in terrorism. So there was nothing we could tell him to disabuse him. Lies became reality. In the end, Casey found a university professor who described himself as a terror expert. And he produced a dossier that confirmed that the hidden terror network did in fact exist. Under such intense lobbying, Reagan agreed to give the neoconservatives what they wanted. And in 1983, he signed a secret document that fundamentally changed American foreign policy. 
the country would now fight covert wars to push back the hidden Soviet threat around the world. The specter of Marxist-Leninist controlled governments with ideological and political loyalties to the Soviet Union poses a direct challenge to which we must respond. They are the focus of evil in the modern world. It was a triumph for the neoconservatives. America was now setting out to do battle against the forces of evil in the world. But what had started out as the kind of myth that Leo Strauss had said was necessary for the American people increasingly came to be seen as the truth by the neoconservatives. They began to believe their own fiction. They had become what they called democratic revolutionaries who were going to use force to change the world. We were aiming for an expansion of the zone of freedom in the world. And in part that had to do with fighting communism and in part it had to do with fighting other kinds of tyrannies. But that's what we were about, it's what we're still about. And when you say you were democratic revolutionaries, what do you mean? It meant that we wanted to support people who wanted to carry out revolutions against tyrannical regimes in the name of democracy in order to install a democratic system. As simple as that? Yeah, that's, it's not nuclear physics, you know. I mean, freedom is a fairly simple thing to get. It's a chancy job. Makes a man watchful and a little lonely. But somebody has to do it. The neoconservatives now set out to transform the world. In next week's episode, they find themselves joining forces with the Islamists in Afghanistan. And together, they fight an epic battle against the Soviet Union. And both come to believe that they had defeated the evil empire. But this imagined victory would leave them without an enemy and in a world disillusioned with grand political ideas, they would need to invent new fantasies and new nightmares in order to maintain their power. I really can't but stay. But baby, it's cold outside. I've got to go but away. But baby, it's cold outside. This evening has been, been hoping that you so drop in. very nice. I'll hold your hands. They're just like My ice. mother will start to Beautiful, worry. Beautiful, what's your heart? And father will be pacing the floor. Listen to the fireplace So roll. really, I'd better scurry. Beautiful, please don't well, hurry. Well, maybe just a half a drink Put more. Put some records on while I The neighbors pour. might think. But baby, it's bad out there. Say, what's in this no drink? No camps to be had out there.